This week, Kumar and Jordan discuss the recent series John Constantine Hellblazer by Simon Spurrier and Aaron Campbell, and not by Jason Aaron. You'll hear Kumar finally catch his own mistake halfway through this discussion of the recent and prematurely concluded DC series. But first, help keep this podcast coming out weekly. Support the show at patreon.com slash deconcomics for as little as $2 a month. With your pledge of at least $4 a month, you can access hours of bonus podcasts, including an issue-by-issue discussion of The Amazing Spider-Man by Lee and Ditko. Pledge your support now at patreon.com slash deconcomics. This is Kumar. This is Jordan. And this is Deconstructing Comics. Welcome to Deconstructing Comics. Um, Kumar and Jordan, this is a face to face, honest right. to God, face to face podcast recording. Yep, we are sitting about a meter apart. It's amazing. Kumar, you're a real person. <laughs> <laughs> you're not just a figment of my imagination. Yeah, so it's been at least, so pre coronavirus, so it's been at least a year since I recorded face anything face to face. And. I thought we should record it here. Somehow I thought the acoustics would be better in my place than in yours next door. Um, I don't know. But but based on... And they thought about it. I was like, wait a second. I've actually only ever recorded in here in this house twice with Ashwin. And once was in the balcony and once was in his bedroom on the floor. Right. So I've never actually recorded in this room. So we don't know... Okay, so it's the it's first gonna time. It's going to be really good. Excellent. We've got this space age microphone <laughs> that came from Jordan's wife that is like the size of my forearm. <laughs> um, so it may be the best recorded. I don't even know if we've got. The, anyway, we've think got that, well, the we've got acoustics two, in this room are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> we've got two devices on the go. Um, anyway, okay, so we're here to talk about the most recent John Constantine Hellblazer series. Not Hellraiser by Clive Barker, no. <laughs> which is what I've called it 50 times. I even Googled something yesterday and was still typing. Wait a second. I was like, what's a word that makes sense? Hellraiser. John Constantine Hellraiser. No, it's not Hellraiser. Um, I've had Hellraiser on the brain for some reason. I've watched nine of the ten movies. Don't do that. Do not do it. They're really bad, especially after four. Um, anyway, so this... Okay, so there's a totally amazing coincidence here. So last yep. time we talked, it was about Books of Magic. Now, that had some Constantine stuff in it, which we... Disc- and I'm, so I'm going to keep saying Constantine. In yes. This, you can say Constantine. We, no, 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 we'll, we'll that get, will balance it. <laughs> okay, if, all right. If we do it that way. That seems fair. Um, okay, so in August... Uh, so the writer of the series is Simon Spurrier... Mm-hmm. And in August, he put this blog post up about how the series had been canceled. And I saw a link to this, and a lot of people were like, this is, it, it was being canceled issue 12. And people were like, this is the worst, this is such a great series. And everybody's talking about how, what a great series it was. And I thought, oh, maybe we could t- do that one. And then, by coincidence, you had been reading a bunch of Hellblazer. Blazer, yeah, yeah. I've been the reading time. the back issues, yeah. And I thought, okay, this is a great opportunity to get on to this and then the first issue was a sandman presents special and it pretty much like the centerpiece of that issue is the scene from books of magic that was set in the future that's where, right, right that's right it kicks off in media res it's in the middle of that grand battle that we see we see briefly when uh, mr e takes timothy hunter on his trip into the future where he's gone bad and he's waging a war against all the good magic users of the future. And uh, that's where the, the series begins. And you're right, it is, it's, a, it's such a crazy coincidence. Because yeah. we were talking about books of magic and it we begins planning from it, a scene. We weren't planning on doing this based on doing books of magic. We no. were doing it based on that blog post about the cancellation and then the coincidence of, of your... I get, or did you start reading? Why did you start reading that Constantine? Was it after the Books of Magic? I can't or? even remember why I started. But perhaps because of the Books of Magic thing. But I just started reading them. I think it must have been Books of Magic that got me onto Constantine. Okay. Constantine. 
<laughs> um, right. Okay, so... Do you know that, Kumar? Sorry, do we interrupt? Yeah. Um, I, I think I just often say Constantine anyway. Yeah. Uh, because I, I saw the movie with Keanu Reeves before I read any of the comics. <laughs> and in fact, when, like, when I was reading these old issues of Constantine, uh, I didn't even realise it was Constantine until I got to a rhyme. Where oh, they rhymed, sure. <laughs> where they um, rhymed a passage, they rhymed the word Constantine with another word that rhymes with Constantine, not Constantine. And I'm okay. like, ha, huh, okay. <laughs> uh, yes, but that's, that could have been, if I had come across that, it would have been um, like the William Blake, oh, there's another coincidence, there's we'll get to that. William Blake, the yeah. tiger, tiger burning, because whenever he gets what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful... Symmetry. Symmetry. <laughs> it's like, come on, Blake, you're, you know what you're doing, why, why is this happening? That will come up as a major theme in this episode. Um, William Blake will, and that poem. Uh, what was I going to say about this? Oh, okay, so... Well, the, the thing about the Constantine Constantine is... Uh, Alan Moore has said he hates it when people say Constantine. Oh, right. Uh, sorry, how many minutes into the podcast are we that Kamal brought up Alan Moore? Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how can we not? Because there's actually, so there's there's lines from Books of Magic in that scene. There's Neil Gaiman yes. lines. I don't yes. think he's, I don't know if he's credited. I didn't look close at the credits of that issue. But also that famous line, I'm a nasty piece of work, Chief. Ask Anyone. Ask Anyone mm. is from Swamp Thing. Yeah, from his first, very first uh, panel or page? Maybe. It's definitely Sting saying it if you look at the panel. <laughs> yes. I think it is that issue 37 of Swamp Thing or whatever. Um, and you hear it in Sting's voice because it's Sting's face when he says it that first time. So that line, there's those two riffs are kind of bookending that first um, issue of this. So this issue is, uh, uh, or this series we should say, so... The confusing thing is, so there was the Vertigo series, and Constantine was one of yes. <laughs> it was one of the first books that, when they created Vertigo 25 years ago, there was like Swamp Thing, Sandman, and Constantine, I feel like, were the three flagship titles mm -hmm. of that. Now, six or seven years ago, they cancelled Constantine, and they cancelled Vertigo, Constantine stopped at issue 300, and Vertigo got shut down as well. I can't remember if they were simultaneous or related, or one happened first, or, well, Constantine happened first. Um, anyway, they, then they shuffled him over into the DC Universe, the normal DC Universe to hang out with Batman and Superman and stuff, and he was, um, I think I saw online someone described him as uh, Dr. Fate in a trench coat, is basically <laughs> what he was right. for a while. And that's a little bit like the... The, uh, the TV version now that we've got is a little bit... Um, he's a little bit kid-friendly. I mean, Ashwin watches those shows. Okay. Um, I haven't seen them. Yeah. He, the guy, Matt, Matt Ryan, is a really good actor in that role. Um, it's a little bit... Uh, a little bit watered down because it's TV for kids. But, I mean, he's still, like, a bisexual who's having sex with anyone who comes along, basically, and all that kind of stuff is still happening, even though it's basically a kind of tweens show. Um, and, okay, so then that was going on. So we had that kind of PG-13 version of Constantine for a lot of years. And then they started this Black Label line. Now, so Black Label is not quite like Vertigo. It is r-rated dc comics so we had a batman comic where you saw bruce wayne's penis and that got pulped uh they were like actually we can't show this so they pulped that issue but it's got that kind of Amazing. nonsense going on right and also now this sandman universe presents and constantine got shuttled over so that's that is actually worked into the plot line of this series where he has seemingly disappeared for seven years, yep. six or seven years, and come back. And they're like, where have you been for seven years, John Constantine? But in publishing terms, it is, I guess, the amount of time he was being hanging out with Batman and Superman and the Justice League and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Um, Thanks. You're always okay. good for that potted history. <laughs> From a storytelling uh, perspective as well, um, yeah. Simon Spurrier... Uh, begins. Uh, he wanted. He's on record as saying that he wanted to show a transition from 
the the big superhero world of storytelling that Constantine had been appearing in and m show a transition to the more traditional kinds of Constantine stories, the right. the more local, the more urban. I got a quote that I took off his blog. Uh, we took the decision early on to attempt some sort of organic transition, letting readers acclimatise to the complicated, haunted, messy protagonist as he was first envisioned by his creator. By easing into his world, we used as our starting point, tonally speaking, the most recent iterations of the character, by which I mean his DCU self, mm -hmm. and the broadly similar live-action version memorably portrayed on TV by Matt Ryan. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Uh, hence... The collected volume opens in media res with some overblown dramatic magical spectacle, then segues bit by bit into the grimy, no-frills breed of cynical occultism readers will recognise from the heyday of Vertigo era. Mm. Hell raised blazer. <laughs> <laughs> um, he does, Jason Aaron, so there's two artists on the main series. They alternate back and forth. There's usually like two or three issue story arcs. Uh, there's Jason Aaron and Matthias Bergara. Uh, Jason Aaron has an almost, he's a photo reference style, it's almost photorealistic. Matthias Bergera is more of a European cartoony style, but Jason Aaron draws Constantine like Matt Ryan. Like he really, he seems to have used his face as a model, it seems like, but just like aged him okay. a lot more, I felt like. Um, uh, what else was I going to say about that? I can't remember. But about the art? Yeah, I can't remember. It might have been, I can't remember who drew that first uh, Sandman, I should have looked that one up. Um, the, uh, the first Sandman Presents issue, which is like a double issue or something like that. Mm. Um, but, oh, it was, uh, his last name was Takara, it's Mark, Mar Marchio Takara or something like that. Anyway, um, okay, so, <laughs> so we've got, uh, it's set during that big war in the future. Uh, John Constantine is approached by this Andy Cap looking dude who turns out <laughs> to be himself from the future as yep. an old man who uh, wants to make a deal for his soul yes. to save him. Now, he's... Yeah, we have the scene from Books of Magic, yep. but from Constantine's perspective this time. Yes. Then Mystery and Timothy wander off. Then this new character wanders right. in. And you're right, he does look a bit like Andy Cap. <laughs> and... Um, and Oh, so we have to mention a couple of things happen here which are really interesting. So, um, he has this... Constantine has this friend who's a cab driver. Now, I uh, haven't read... Jazz. Oh, yeah, we should talk a little bit about my previous experience with Constantine. So, I only I only know Sandman... I'm oh, sorry, Swamp Thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I read the Garth Ennis arc where he sells his soul... Uh, or sorry, he gets lung cancer. Yep. So the way he solves this is by selling his soul to three different demons so they fight over him. Yes. Um, and my memory of that was that it was like... The the way he came about the solution was uh, kind of clumsy. It was like early Garth Ennis. Because basically he goes, he sits on a park bench. Yes. <laughs> and he thinks about it really hard. And then he's like, aha! I've got, it. and it's all in narrative captions. I I know how I'll beat them, and then he goes and executes and his plan. It, yeah. There's no like, I don't know. I guess it would be a cliche to see some kid on the street do something that triggers the thought, or you know what I mean, that kind of thing. So there's not anyway. So I read that, and I read um, the Neil Gaiman issue. Uh, Hold me. You did read that last time we spoke. You hadn't. Read no, that. I had read it in the past, ah. and I was gonna reread it. Ah. Um, and it was drawn by Dave McKean. I did have another look at that. Um, and I remember I really liked it. And I was liking it again. But I remember Emmett said something to me. He, how he had some issues with it. And I actually emailed. And I said, what was your thing about it? And he said, um, uh, it seemed to lack sympathy for the lack of choices that uh, same-sex couples had for getting children in the 90s or something like that. I Okay. I have to... I'm butchering the words he said, but it sounded legit, like a legit, okay, that kind of makes sense, that that's, it would be an issue you would have with that particular issue of it. But anyway, it was interesting in that because um, rereading it last night, there's a scene where uh, he's... Constantine's in a cab with this really racist cab driver, taxi driver, and it super annoys him, and then he gets out and he talks about the... This is like the national, like this nationalist party or whatever. 
Um, and that was that issue was in 1990, and that's what this whole series is about. 30 years later, yeah. uh, and I'd read the Brian Azzarello, Richard Corbin Hard Time, which I lent to you. Yes, but I bought that series for the Corbin art, and I reread that, and I was like, "This is a really nasty five issue series. It's really grim and gross, maybe even a little homophobic." Um, and uh, he actually doesn't really have a good I felt Azarallo didn't have a good handle on the Constantine dialogue. And one thing we'll get to in mm. this is, holy cow, the dialogue is so sharp. Not just for Constantine, every character. As soon as they say one sentence, and one of the bummers about this episode is, I think the best thing about the series, maybe the dialogue, but I can't really read it because I can't do any of the accents or anything. <laughs> but you can hear the voices, and it's the lettering is by... Um, Aditya Bidikar, and uh, it's really quite uh, mercurial. I think it, I'm positive it's computer lettered, but sometimes words are done in really small font or in lowercase or uppercase, and when people are singing, it's got kind of a wavy flow to it, and there's all these, all the kind of playing with the lettering itself, and you really hear every character very distinctly. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, this is probably a good point in the podcast to mention that I really like this series. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Yeah, it's it's really well written. I like the art. As you say, the dialogue is really good. Uh, it's just, it's excellent. Yeah. Yeah, I really enjoy it. Um, I, I like the themes. I, lo I love how topical it is. Yeah, well, this is part of the sleeping and waking. So when he wakes, so I was reading the first issue, I was like, oh, this is really pretty good. And then he wakes up in an insane asylum, yep. or some sort of asylum, seven years after he had disappeared. Yes. And he he runs out of the place, and he sees this big billboard for Brexit. Yes. And I was like, <laughs> <What>? holy <laughs> shit. We're in, like, new territory now. He's like, what is going on? What is this? And uh, it's like a really, it is like a Brexit... The whole thing is about that. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thematically beginning to end. And it's all about, um, I guess we'll get into it when we get into the nuts and bolts of the plot, but it's about pride and patriotism versus nationalism. And um, this, he basically is fighting this monster who is himself, his self in the future, is somehow creating these, um, what is it? There's a five letter word he uses. Tulpa. Tulpa. These kind of mind things from your mind that are given physical form, yes. but they're all, every one of them has some sort of, um, it feeds on people's pride. It, yes. it, it causes them to fear, and that causes a kind of pride, but that pride takes the form of hating mm. outsiders, foreigners. Yeah. Um, and every issue, there's some, it takes some form of this kind of racism or something like that. Yeah, that's the theme. There's a, a grand spell occurring in Britain uh, that's caused the baffling political situation yeah. that's going on over there at the moment. If anyone, I don't know if the listeners are like me and look at the UK and just don't understand how this has happened, why people are so xenophobic and yeah. blind yeah. and why they've voted it so plainly against their own interests. Well, Simon Spuria has an answer for you. It's evil magic. Well, I would say it's a better <laughs> answer than evil magic even because what often happens with something... Okay, I'll give you an example, a perfect example of something that happens with this kind, any kind of metaphysical or, you know, fantasy type show. So, um, they did this series of The Punisher in the 90s where they had run dead out of ideas. Okay. And they're like, okay, what happened actually was... Um, Gangs the gangsters that killed his family were actually possessed by demons and this was a war between demons and angels So now the Punisher is gonna kill demons <laughs> Okay, okay, and for me this was very upsetting because my thing is Humans are capable of great evil and to say hmm. that the reason this guy or Hitler was possessed by something and that's what caused that no that reduces a much worse evil, a human evil, to a fictional demonic evil, if you know what I mean. What happens here is this creature comes along, hmm. this Andy Cap comes along, yeah. 
and he doesn't create the fear. It's there. Yes, that's true. And he's like, ah, he finds this politician yes. who's like fear mongering yes. and riling up all this hate against foreigners. And he's like, ah, I'm going to take over this guy's body because I love this whoa, whoa. fear. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, you've, um, yes, you're right, actually. You're quite right. It doesn't excuse, it doesn't explain away everything. It doesn't pardon uh, the people for the, the the bad choices they've made. Rather, he transforms fear into pride. He yes. finds he finds a nation frightened, and he he casts this grand weird to transform their fear into damaging uh, xenophobic pride. Although you've 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 conflated two characters, I should point out. Uh, okay. Kumar. If if you'll let me. Oh, you're right. You're right. Sorry. Yes. You're right. <laughs> yes. Um, and this is one of the, this is another one of the a, a great piece of storytelling. This is issue eleven, I think. Okay. Uh, where, about the boggart. Yeah. Rawhead. Right. Right. Sorry. Uh, yeah. That in a previous issue, Constantine re receives a phone call from someone who's railing at him, begging him to pick up because something terrible has happened. Anyway, it, so in issue eleven, we see the contents of that phone call, uh, and what it is is that there's a. Uh, a uh, a boggart, like, um, which from Harry Potter is the monster that uh, is your worst fear. Right. I'm not sure if it's a reference to Harry Potter. If boggart is a real thing. No, it is a real thing because then it gets down to boogeyman. Like he talks about how it's evolved over the centuries. Yes. But anyway, yes. Yeah. But he's he's a, a fear monster. Yeah. Anyway, uh, he uh, and uh, he, as you say, finds a this politician who's whipping up fear and is so into that that he yeah. takes over his body. He skins him and assumes his identity. Yeah. And, oh boy, the good times have come. He's he's f f gorging on fear and having such a great time that he doesn't know, that he didn't even notice as time went on, suddenly the fear was drying up and being replaced by something else. Right. It was being replaced by pride. Right. Because the uh, Andy Cap Constantine had, uh, had cast his, done his great work across the country, sprinkling around his, his tulpas, his, his thought constructs, which, which uh, feed or, and, or stimulate or feed or create pride among all the people who they're attached to. And suddenly this boggart is starving and he doesn't know why. And then they invite him down under the parliament. Right. And then I don't know if we want to For the ultimate... That. Yeah, we will, maybe we will later because we have to talk about that because it's so. They crazy. want him to commit the ultimate prideful act right. in this in under par Parliament, and he can't do it because he's not a creature that thrives on pride. He's the thing that right. eats fear. And I, I I really like this issue. I I love the self-contained story about the Boggart that also how it tied into the themes yeah. of the of the series. Also, it, the guy was super scary. Like he, um, he's so he's this fear creature that has stolen. Um, he's stolen the skin of this guy, but when he makes the phone call, he's got a he's got this to constantly he's got the skin pulled up over his nose, <laughs> uh, and it was really creepy. Yeah, I I I liked that issue a lot. I loved the I, I really liked the storytelling. It um, I know you're not as big a fan of Neil Gaiman as I am, but it had a real Gaiman esque kind of feel, playing with. Uh, with myths and uh, and uh, fantasies, yeah, I guess sort of, yeah. Uh, I yeah, that to me is praise. I understand. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 yeah, <laughs> no. I think the game in Esk issue was the one where Andy Cap takes Constantine through on this kind of dream journey, and they actually end up in the dreaming and see the Daniel version of dream and all that oh, kind yeah, of stuff. Oh yeah, they happens. do, don't they? Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's who it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, what was I going to say? Oh yeah, so there was about the pride thing. There was a the issue in the hospital. He actually talk, they actually talk about the NHS, which is really I mean they, I I love how yeah. raw this series was, and it was mm. really it was so August two thousand twenty. Uh, yeah. Well, except there's no coronavirus in it for some. No, there's no coronavirus in it. No, it predates coronavirus. But um, there's how was I wish I'd written down the line. He says something. Constantine delivers this great line about how, in a good year, pride. Oh, Kumar, I wrote the, it down. Please read it. <laughs> so when you're poor, yeah. If in a good year, pride means holding your head high. Yeah. In a bad year, or in a bad fucking decade, having pride just means finding someone to look down on. Yeah. 
Yeah, that was the line, yeah. And he was talking about how in the good year they had created the NHS during the good times. That had been the result of their national pride. And now it was um, um, causing all these people to hate other people. And that's a thing that constantly comes up, too, is all this hatred. Um, okay, do we want to kind of go through issue by issue, maybe? Is that the we best can do. approach? We, we absolutely can do. Um, oh, I, we also... Oh, we missed one. Did you... Is that what you were going to bring up? Sorry. No, I was going to miss. I was going to bring up that uh, something we, because we, I was forced to mention Alan Moore, which we have to. <laughs> Another thing we have to yeah. any time. I we think talk every about episode comics, we're going to have to have the Alan Moore timer. Well, for any, when you bring well, up. there's also the, we, there's another timer we need for whenever we talk about horror comics because there has to be a Lovecraft <laughs> oh, yes. mention of Lovecraft because yeah. there is a great hilarious line. I wrote it down as he's well. He's fighting these monsters. I laughed so many times, as grim and as oftentimes very scary as this comic was. I laughed so many times, and there was a line where he's fighting these monsters, and he's looking at the sky, and he says, these monsters that are straight out of Lovecraft's personal, personal wank, wank bank. bank. God, what a great, <laughs> what a great line. Um, and there are all those billions of lines that I can't, again, I won't read because, uh, because I can't do the accents, and especially with Nat, the, uh, I think she's a Scottish bouncer, she works at this bar, and there's a hilarious line where Constantine goes into his first bar and he's telling dirty jokes and he gets tossed out Yes. and she's like well maybe you shouldn't have tried to tell your off color jokes in a artisanal microbrewery micro full of hipsters or something like yes. that and it's so obvious he has no idea what world he's living in seven years later it's like completely transformed yeah so great mm. yeah um Okay, so what was the thing that we missed that we were... That you oh, it's not important. Uh, it's just that um, when we read it, we read the uh, Sandman Universe one that we were talking about with yes. Lovecraft's Perfect Snow Wank Bank. Yes. Uh, <laughs> then we read uh, 1 to 12. Yeah. But there's oh, another one in Books of Magic where apparently... You remember at the end of issue one, oh. he says, I've got to go find Timothy Hunter first, then I'm going oh. to the pub. Oh, and then in the that. and then but then in the first issue he's in the pub. Right. It's like, well, what happened to Timothy Hunter? And then he has a demon in his cell phone. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Constantine can't use his cell phone unless there's a demon living in it to right. do all the functions <laughs> right. for him. Oh yeah. There's one scene. There's one scene where the phone rings and he freaks out. <laughs> yeah. there, the same issue that he also does a spit take at one stage. Somebody says something. Oh yeah. Nat says he hasn't. He's just acting like a normal guy. He's pretending he's a normal guy. And uh, he sits down at the bar and she says something like, so you're a wizard. And he, there's a literal <laughs> spit take of where he spits out his beer. In the same issue, I think it's the same issue, his phone rings in his pocket and he like goes, ah, he freaks out because the light, it like vibrates and lights up. Yeah, anyway, sorry, go on. Okay, so Constantine has a demon in his smartphone yeah. called the Vestibulum. Yes. And um, it was apparently bound into his phone by Timothy Hunter. And if ah. you want to see this scene... Okay. You have to go and read an issue of Books of Magic, which Kamara and I didn't do. Okay. So. You actually don't even need to read the Sandman Presents issue I, necessarily. Well, it's funny you mention that because I didn't at first. Okay. I read the whole. I read the 11, first 11 issues, not the 12th because it hadn't come out at that point. But I read the first 11 issues yeah. and then read the Sandman Presents. Right. And it was fine. In fact, it was right. quite. Yeah, so it was quite. Because, yeah, it does eventually. Re it's revealed slowly mm. uh, that. In fact, it kind of the Sandman presents kind of spoils it a little bit. It does a little bit. Although there's a great, well, there's a couple of super important things that happen in that zero, let's call it the zero issue. So one is, uh, yeah. So he's got that ta taxi driver friend, Chaz. Chaz, and I don't know if he's from previous Sand. Hey, from absolutely is. He's in. He is. Okay. He's in the whole the whole comic. Oh, okay. Start I didn't realize yeah. that. So he comes along and. Um, Constantine tricks him into going and fighting these demons, and really what he wants is for the demons to be distracted so that the angels can f fly in and kill them or something effectively yeah. like that. But he sacrifices this guy, yeah. and that's thematically very important, how yeah. he basically he surrounds himself with disposable people. Yeah. But he says, the line he gives is something like, I just sacrificed my best friend or something like that. And I thought, first I thought, well, Constantine has friends? And I thought, well, maybe he has, like, really casual friends, and this is the best of them, and that's what he means. If anyone counts, forward. it would be him, because, as I said, he's there right. from pretty much the get-go. Right. From 1 through to, well, as, as far as I've read, I haven't read all the way to 300, but... Right. So, uh, the taxi explodes, Chaz dies, the taxi sign off the roof <laughs> jabs Constantine on the side, which is the thing that's going to kill him, which is maybe a little bit on the nose... To have that be the fatal blow. Well, anyway, um, 
so yeah, the the thing about sacrificing friends is really super key. I mm -hmm. also love at the end. So he comes out, he gets out of the asylum, and he's in um, he's in like hospital gown. Um, and the first thing he does is he robs a trench coat from a charity shop window, and I love that touch. So I think you can skip that issue, but I think the death of Chaz is really pretty key, uh, and I think stealing that that thing, and I think the line. If there is one negative to the writing, I think there is a habit of saying exactly who Constantine is. Like, somebody will say, oh, you need to surround yourself with disposable people. Right. Or, um, like, when Nat, Nat, as soon as he meets Snatch, she says, I'm not going to sleep with you. And he's like, what? I never said anything like that. She says, I know your type. You've been away for a long time. You need to convince yourself you have a circle. Right. Yeah, it is and, the, how, yeah how would you put that? I, I'm, I'm inclined to agree, actually. I kind of... And it was negative, but imagine if it wasn't there, like, I mean, I would prefer it to be subtextual yes. in a sense, but I, I mean, it, it shows how, what a, it, it shows what a clear handle Cy Spurrier has on the character, I think, because it was very clearly defined. And especially when you get to the finale and how, I mean, you think it's going to work out in a positive way and it works out in a very negative way very brutal way the yes. the final solution to it and it's like that you kind of need that his character to be defined and in a sense i'm kind of glad he did it because the series got canceled you know so he wouldn't he didn't have another 20 issues to actually build it up in a way yes well let okay I, i've got some things to okay, say about sure. the finale as well sure but shall we should we commit to yes. going through it issue okay. by issue? Yeah, or I, yeah, look, at least right, so, a bit. I know, like Kumar says, you, you you probably should read issue zero. Okay. But if you want, you can commit to my uh, accidental, <laughs> anachronistic reading of it, which is read, um, read one to twelve, read one to eleven. Yeah. Then read zero. <laughs> then read twelve. I can okay. recommend this. So okay. if you're thinking of reading these comics. Okay. And you, yeah, I guess you should throw Timothy Hunter in there somewhere as well. But I haven't yeah. even read that yet, so I couldn't tell you where he fits in. But yeah, read read one to eleven, then read zero, then read twelve. That's my advice. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So, one, two, and three are all one. Oh, sorry. Uh, before we move on, yeah, uh, there's sorry. one thing I wanted to say. Okay. Uh, so Chaz twi dies twice in issue zero. Okay. He oh he he's he dies when Constantine tricks him into <laughs> carrying a pig's head with nonsense written on it. Yes. Oh yeah, you're right. He literally writes like the word fuck or something on his head. <laughs> this pig's head like six times, and it looks like runes, but you have to look at the panel closely, and it's yeah, not runes. Love that. He's just he, he yeah, tricks poor really old Chaz into thinking he's got a magic nuke. Which is just a pig's head with fuck written on it. Yeah. And uh, Chaz believes it so strongly, though, that all the demons pick up on his belief. Yeah. And chase him down and kill him, thinking he really does have some kind of magical nuke. Uh, but and then, but then, once Constantine wakes up in the mental hospital, once he is, once he leaves, uh, he goes. He tries to find Chaz. First thing, almost first thing he does, he's knocking on his door. Yeah. Let me in. I don't know any of the good pubs anymore. Right. Uh, Chaz is in the hospital with terminal cancer. Yeah. And why does he have terminal cancer? Yeah, yeah, right. Because Constantine, because of secondhand smoke. Because Constantine's been smoking in his cab, in his cab yeah, right. for yeah. 30 years. Yeah. And I just really like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's a really great postscript almost to Ennis's thing where, oh, hey, look how grown up my comic is. Constantine gets lung cancer right. from smoking because smoking's really bad for you. But then it's cured. <laughs> it's yeah. cured by demons. <laughs> Chaz, on the other hand, is die well i don't know if he dies in the con but he he's dying he's, he's dying and he's gonna die because con does a constant try to take the demons away from him yeah. by shuttling them into another patient into another terminal patient yeah. in the same ward in the same room he's like i'm gonna shuttle these demons over here to save chaz and chaz is like no screw you yeah. chaz is haunted by demons who know that chaz is constantine's longest running companion yeah they're waiting for him to come back so that they can get revenge on him but right. they're a bit pitiful actually they don't seem to have any kind of power they just hang around complaining about how much they hate Constantine. Constantine sees that and he goes well I better get these demons out of my mate Chaz I'll just stick them in this old lady yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Chaz is like listen here you son of a bitch I yeah. hate your guts you killed me with second hand smoke don't stick demons in another innocent yeah just piss off and, and let me die yeah and I, yeah, that was a pretty good scene. Yeah. Another key scene, I think. Yeah, he th he is very, especially in that series, you get a sense of the ends justify the means with him, with Chaz, and with that woman. He's like, 
she's going to die anyway. I'll save my buddy or whatever. And it's very much like, well, kill two people to save three kind of logic that goes through it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's everything I wanted to say about... Okay. Uh, about it's good. You've got your notes typed up. I've been doing this show for 10 years. I swear I've been... Sometimes I type them. Sometimes I type them and reorganize them. Sometimes I handwrite them. I've got these useless handwritten notes. <laughs> that have no... <laughs> anyway. More on Hellblazer in a moment. Thanks to our supporters on Patreon, another set of classic early episodes of Deconstructing Comics has been unlocked, and I'm putting them back on the site in reverse order. This week I'll republish number 25, from August 7, 2006, in which Brandon and I discuss an article about the supposed stigma of being a webcomics creator, She-Hulk by Dan Slott and Juan Bobillo, and The Art of Comic Book Inking by Gary Martin. Find the classic Deconstructing Comics episodes on our Facebook and Twitter feeds by choosing the earliest months listed in the sidebar pull-down menu at deconstructingcomics.com, in publicly available posts on our Patreon page, or in the Patreon smartphone app. Classic episodes have been unlocked back to number 31, so only four more classic episodes will be re-released unless we meet our next Patreon goal, unlocking 15 more classic episodes. Check out all our goals and help us reach them at patreon.com slash deconcomics. You like cheap comic books, right? Well, I'm Professor Allen, and I talk about cheap comic books on the Quarterbin Podcast. In every episode, I'll dissect a single comic from my collection, as long as I paid no more than 25 cents for the issue. Forget about $4 new comics that you can read in four minutes or crossover events that can cost a hundred bucks to collect. Join me in the quarter bin, where even bad comics are a bargain, and good ones are a steal. The Quarter Bin Podcast is part of the Relatively Geeky Podcast Network. Visit us at relativelygeekypodcast.blogspot.com or search Relatively Geeky or Quarter Bin Podcast in iTunes. I guarantee it'll be worth every Penny. All right. Um, okay. Zero, one, two. Sorry. One, two, and three are a story arc about these angelic beings in the park that are. I think they're they're killing people in the park. Um, this is preventing a local gang from doing their drug dealing. Mm -hmm. But the head of this gang is himself a sorcerer of some sort. Um, He's a Harrispex, Harrispex, an auger that works with entrails. <laughs> right. Yes. And um, oh my God, I love the dialogue here. It was. It's really like it's. If you can imagine teen British gang dialogue, you can't it's understand like a foreign language. it. It is and, like, and, and it is to Constantine as well. He can barely. They all say bruv, bruv, and, <laughs> and stuff. But that's that's mild. Like you can understand bruv, but there was so much that you're like, whoa, what is this guy saying? But it was so. It's, again, it was so sharp right from the word go, you, and you kind of you kind of start to understand it after a while what they're talking about. I like yes, yeah. It was I, I liked how one of uh, Constantine is kidnapped by two of these uh, gang gang members. Yeah, and um, he arrives, and the the sorcerer is spraying out this dialogue, and one of the other one of the two hoods that picked him up is also spraying out the dialogue. And Constantine's like, I don't understand a word of what's going on. And what's this guy's problem? Points to the second of the yeah. gates. He's like, what's this guy's problem? He hasn't said a damn word. What is he? What is he dumb? Or he says, does he speak any English or something? Yeah. Like that? And then, and then, uh, <laughs> and then, one of the, the other gangster pulls up short, who moments ago had been talking unintelligibly, unintelligibly, pulls up short and says, "Hey, whoa, that's ableist." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's, that was the funniest line. That was one of the all-time funniest lines. Um, yeah, and because he's actually mute. He is actually mute, and that's uh, that's Noah. He becomes a Noah. major player mm. uh, through the series, the Mute Kid. Uh, really, probably maybe the second most important character in it besides Constantine. But almost not until the end, you don't really realize how important he is. Yes. Um, okay, so we've got these demons in the park, and then it turns out that it's all there's a there's a homeless guy there. Um, it's all, and he's kind. It's all kind of coming out of his mind. They figure out, and it's all tied into Blake's poetry. Yes, and how this guy has turned that into a kind of thing about the superiority of England. And, yes, yeah. um, yes, he's racist. 
Yeah. But, and this is why I like the build up here. He, he's racist, but his craziness is more important at this point than right. his racism. So, Spirit is not banging us over the head with yeah. his message. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's, it's, he really eases us in. In fact, I don't think it gets really political until the NHS issue. Yes. Because before that, it's just sort of, sort of crazy people doing. Yeah, doing because bad in that, because in that arc, I remember. Constantine called him on being a racist. I was like, wait, did he say something racist? And it wasn't until I went through the issue again. I was like, oh yeah, he said that and that. And I almost didn't pick up on it. Mm. And in mm. the second issue, it's they actually don't find a major uh, center of magical activity, but they visit the crows or the yeah. ravens at the, at the Tower, Tower of London. Tower yeah. of London, and they they're for some reason these. These crow, these ravens are hexing foreigners only, but that's only the only kind of touch you get in those two issues, really about it. Yeah, so it does definitely. A very, very from that Brexit time, sign at the end of the zero issue, yeah, it really um, kind of builds up, and then you start realizing it's a patterns emerging, and the word pride keeps turning up again and again in all of them. Um, okay, is there anything we want to call out on these uh, the first arc? Hmm. Uh, I love when the detective catches him in the toilet. <laughs> I mean, there's so many the funny detective. scenes. There's so many great moments. This detective, they're standing next to each other at the urinals, and he's got a knife under his dick. And <laughs> just really, he's about to tell because he's this detective's wearing a turban. He's about to tell. He tells an off about, joke. He's about to tell an off color joke about a guru. Like, what's a what's a what's he saying? What's a guru's favorite? What's a seek? What's a guru's favorite game? And he's about to say hide, hide and seek. seek. No, no, no. But then, then he goes, yeah. You know, don't tell that joke. Look, I got my bad. Do you know? Did you notice there's a badge on my turban? And then Constantine goes, No, I didn't notice. Let me turn. Maybe, let me turn around. And you know, he's getting ready to urinate on the guy's shoes. And then the guy says, Please don't. And. Uh, the, it, it's really well drawn. Yeah. Like one point, he's 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 smugly in in one panel. Constantine is smugly grinning about how he's about to play, yeah, yeah. <laughs> about to do this classic practical joke on the Sikh, and in the next, <laughs> he's horrified because yeah. the whereas the Sikh's expression doesn't change. Yeah, yeah. All that's happened is that he's moved his arm over and he's got his knife under yeah, Constantine's yeah, yeah. Yeah, balls. And there's a great there's a great callback to that scene in the. Th- third issue where Constantine pulls the same trick on him but he's got a butter knife. <laughs> um, it was so good. It's, that's another thing about this comic. It's very funny. Yeah, it's so funny and very upset. It's strange to me how it's really kind of balanced out mm. and part of that's in the art too which we're kind of going to get to when we get to issue four because suddenly you've got a switch to Matthias Ber- Bergara, Bergara with the art. Yeah. Right. Um... Instead of uh, Jason Aaron, so it's it, much, so yes, yeah. So issue four. So suddenly we've got this very cartoony European art style, right? And uh, it was actually a relief, as, <laughs> as awesome as the Jason Aaron art was in those first three issues, because it's so photorealistic. You're really in there. And when we get to the, there's another issue later on which is set in a fish market, and. Mm. It's very easy for a writer, a comic book scriptwriter, to say Constantine goes to a fish market. But to draw that, it's a nightmare. Any artist reading that would be like, I have to draw a goddamn fish market. <laughs> but when you get, the, it is a fish market, and you are in that world completely, and it's uh, it's astonishing. But at, say, after three issues of that, it's very full on. And switching to a lighter mm. art style was really. A relief and it was a joy and those are really those issues are very light and funny and in issue four he meets this uh magician called tommy willow tree tommy willow trees oh yeah i wanted to talk about him yeah yeah Please we'll go. talk about him because he's just kind of uh he's super annoying for constantine because he's yeah. a hipster uh yoga dude who's into kombuchas and every he, he only he, drinks organic. There is no trendy new age idea that he does not uncritically embrace. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, Constantine can't stand him. Everybody else seems to kind of like him. Yes. Now, I, I think this perhaps is one of the area. One of the, is is something that the comic doesn't really do well. It's one okay. of the areas where it falls down a little bit. And is Tommy Willow Trees. I don't think they can. I don't think Simon Spurrier can quite figure out what we're supposed to feel about him. <laughs> He's, well, he's, Constantine finds him incredibly annoying. Yeah. He's a caricature of, as I said, of every new age fad you could possibly imagine. Yeah. Including puns. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> and yet, and yet the 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 and yet the script, the script tells us that he's immensely likable, okay. and that people who meet him can't help but like him. Right. And I, yeah, I I don't I can't figure out exactly how we're supposed to feel about. Are we supposed to like him? Are we supposed to dislike him? I think we're. I, <laughs> good question. Reading the issues, you're not sure. When you get to the last issue, you're like, oh, we were supposed to like him. Yeah. Based I, on his we'll talk about that. fate, <laughs> I think we were supposed to really feel for the guy. And I've probably given away what happens to him just on, on that statement yeah. alone. Um, I think he... We were spo okay, he's so. really earnest. He, he worships the ground that Constantine walks on. That's yes. the key thing. That's another thing that annoys Constantine about him is he really loves, he wants to be, he thinks Constantine's the greatest magician of all time and mm -hmm. wishes he could be like him or whatever. Um, and he's been he's been tricked as well. He's been conned he, by yes. older, nastier uh, wizards who were characters introduced in the, in the old Constantine run. Right. Uh, I think by Warren Ellis. Okay. Uh, and they've realized something bad is coming. Okay. And they, what they do is they trick Tommy Willow Trees. They give him a bunch of tat, yep. like some some props, which they tell him are Merlin's sacred instruments. Right. And tell him that it's his destiny to stop evil. Right. And then they bugger off to America or something. Right. And uh, their their idea is that either Tommy Willow Trees will solve uh, the problem, or he'll mess it up trying and Constantine will have to come in and, and fix his mess. Well, they actually, they wanted Constantine, but he had vanished. Yeah. To play with Batman. Um, <laughs> in a mental song. Imagine he was playing with Batman. Anyway. Yes, so, yeah. <laughs> they had wanted Constantine, they couldn't find him. So what they did was they convinced Tommy, but they said the thing is, either Tommy would die trying, so Constantine would stop, he would intervene and do it himself. Yeah. Or he would, he would succeed, which Constantine would not be able to stand the thought of. So that would be either way he would have to step in and yeah, that's right. solve the big bad. Um, I was going to say, I think that those two issues drawn, I think for Tommy to, at least for him to be what either, however you want to look at him, for him to be introduced with art by Matthias Vergara was a better choice than having Jason Aaron draw does he, I don't think he draws... Does he draw him at all? The last issue, the okay, 12th right. issue. He oh, finally yeah, he does. looks completely different. Yeah. And he does look different. I think it was... But the other thing is, Matthias Vergara, you know, okay, these are going to be the fun, lighthearted... And they kind of are. There's a drinking contest kind of in there, which <laughs> is really funny. pretty funny. <laughs> that is funny. Um, all that kind of stuff is in there. But then, they're, okay, when you get to a Vergara issue, you're like, okay, this is going to be a funny one. But then, you know, when he draws the unicorn, it is frightening, yeah, right? It's a it's scary image. Um <laughs> <laughs> that unicorn. When that when that issue. comes up, so oh, um, yeah, in a way, and I think Jason here. Sometimes Jason here, when he draws, um, when like when there's a huge supernatural confluence of things happen, the panel goes completely red, like the colors go red. We should also mention that uh, the every issue, no matter who the artist was, colored by Jordi Belair. So it's the same colorist, um, and sometimes it's it's absolutely beautiful. Like there's one of the Bergara, you don't expect it from him, but um, there is a panel which just shows the Thames and it's like like blue and it's just really lovely a lovely image um I like uh if we're talking about pages that we liked I really liked the one where Constantine reluctantly uh uh, starts buying into Tommy's uh, bullshit the one where he knights him as oh, yeah. his, as his prime yeah. paladin yeah. his magic court yeah yeah and he's got this exasperated look on his face he's holding out one of the yeah, yeah. one of the dime store props and he's going uh, i dubbed these something or other yeah yeah and they've got an english cross in the back it just it looks really great yeah yeah and, and Vergara's good at drawing he also draws uh constantine older than jason aaron i think he looks like more mid 50s to me than the jason he looks aaron. awful <laughs> he's got yeah, bags under really, his eyes yeah. looks really rough but jason aaron so those red panels sometimes you can't really tell what's going on it's all these kind of spiritual beings fighting each other or something and he's really i guess distorted them digitally or something i don't right. know and it's very can be a little bit hard to follow i never don't remember really having that problem with Bergara as much and it's but so you know it's usually a problem with photo referenced art like that in general is something that often it gets hard to follow and we talked about that a bit with books of magic and the painted art and the stiffness and that's never usually a problem with Jason Aaron except for those am I even is it Jason Aaron I, 
Oh this God. is your. This is I'm the gonna, part of. I'm going to double this. This is your this. responsibility. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it is. Anyway, uh, okay. So pick that up. I'll uh, I'll pull this up and look it up. Um, anyway, okay. So we were getting into issue four and Tommy Willow Tree. Uh, poor Tommy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the racist crows. <laughs> Um, okay, then we get to issue six, which is the NHS issue. Yeah, this is where the the themes of the of the of the series become explicit. Right. There's a racist ghost. Yes. Uh, yeah, racist ghost that's going around killing any foreigner in palliative. It's it's palliative care or or uh, or, or just long term care in, yeah. in the hospital. Not palliative, but long term care. And this this ghost uh, belong is stalking the halls, and it kills anyone foreign, despite the fact that they're not foreign at all. Or you know, one of them's an old, a, a Gurk, like a, an old Gurkha. Yeah. Who'd fought for the in the British yeah. Armed Forces? No, none of them have done anything wrong ever. Mm. Another one was a refugee from Serbia, I yeah. think. But you know, the fact that they weren't, and of course, when Constantine confronts this ghost. The ghost can't harm him because he was... He's British. <laughs> because he's British. Cause he, well, because he, he fits her definition of British. Right. Because he was born... Because he has 20 generations of people born in Britain before him. Right. And born within sight of the Thames or something like that. Right. Um, yeah, what was I going to say about this... But she's another... It turns out the ghost is, is, is not a real ghost, but it's another one of these tulpas... Another one of these thought forms. Yeah. So the the um, oh my god, Andy Cap Constantine. It's not Jason. It's Aaron Campbell. Okay. I apologize. So let's <laughs> re-record the last forty-nine minutes. <laughs> oh my god. Just edit that. I'll out. make sure. No, we'll put it. We'll put it in the show notes for sure. Oh my goodness. Oh well. Oh well. You're only human. Uh, After Jason all. Aaron, I think was was maybe a writer. He's a comics writer or something. There was one guy that badmouthed Alan Moore, and if that's who I said, if that was Jason Aaron, I, why, why am I, why am I digging myself in his hole? Aaron Campbell, I'm so sorry, Aaron Campbell, amazing oh artist. Yeah. Oh dear. Uh, okay, where were we? Racist ghost. Yes, racist ghost. Um, none of the foreigners, anyone who's attacked, never, never deserves it. Hmm. Like there's a French fisherman later on, and. Um, in every... The little girl who's um, attacked by the ravens at the tower? Yeah. Another one? Yeah, mm. just innocent people. Mm. Uh, or even people that are benefiting England in some way. Yes, sure. Um, and the f fear is there, and then Andy Cap comes in and gives them something. Transmogrifies it into pride. Yes. And it's almost like the, the the fisherman as well, that guy. So he's like the youngest guy, and he's like when this when his fish the old fishermen are like complaining about the Frenchmen and how the French are stealing their fish. He's like, actually, I don't think that's it, guys. I think it's something else. But then he starts to get worried about his his supply starts to dwindle a bit, and he starts to get worried about mm. it. And that's when he gets approached by yep. old Constantine. That's right. He's a I yeah. He's a bit of a pitiful figure, although he's. He's 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 scum, but he he starts he, off, he hates yeah, himself. He, changes, he, yeah. he yeah. Well, that's the effect of the of yes. the, the, the 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 poisonous pride that he's infected with. So Andy, this guy, he he's too dumb to. I, I, he was too dumb to go to school, or he didn't have the opportunity. So he's stuck in in the fishing. He drives some crappy old boat. He he forgets to he forgets to untie it from the dock when he's driving off. He he hates it. He hates his job, and he's frightened uh, for the future. Uh, and then Andy Cap shows up, gives him a magic seashell, which uh, I guess empowers him with the ability to create a thought form, and he creates a mermaid. Right. A mermaid that loves him. Yeah. Actually. And uh, she drives fish into his net for him, so suddenly he's a big shot fisherman, and the times are good, and he's proud, and... He starts buying into the lies that the other fishermen were telling, that it's all the French's fault. The French are fishing in our traditional waters, and they're stealing all the fish. And so he starts, he directs his mermaid girlfriend to start attacking French fishermen. And they do that, and then, you know, suddenly, and he's bragging about it yeah. in the pub, and suddenly he's a big shot. And it, 
when I first, when I was looking back on this, I was thinking, hang on, I, I get the other, I get what's going on with some of the other issues, what the end game is. It's like, I don't really understand, this is sort of just a tragic story of, of the poor abused mermaid. What did Andy Cap get out of it? Mm. But, but what he gets out of it is that he becomes puffed up with right. pride. Right. And in fact, he starts... In one scene in the pub, he's, he's buying people drinks and he's bragging about how they need to start a movement or, or something. Uh, or, and it's like, ah, yeah. It's the poisonous yeah. pride. Yeah. I think these are actually my two favorite issues Mine of the too. run. I, I um, loved them. Really liked them. I think the art was... I think that, like I said, the fish market, just seeing a fish... The, a drawing of a fish market is astonishing. Um, and uh, the mermaid is so frightening um, when she, you see her real face, uh, and also when you see what her what's lover be, has, of her? has oh. done to her, it is so horrific, uh, that, yeah, I think these were really... These two issues, seven, they're the, I think they're thematically the richest as well. And they... also, yeah, and coming after the hospital one, you realize, ah, this is what, it's, it, this thing is ter actually turning people into more, it's turning them into racists, it's turning their fear into racism. Yeah, um, and it all kind of comes together, I think, in these in these two, I really felt. Um, the, yeah, well, I feel like the, in these two, these those two, yeah, as you say, they're, they're beautifully drawn. It's beautifully written. Yeah. The mermaid's dialogue, she talks in a, a kind of old, uh, a very lyrical kind of prose. Yeah, and I somehow, again, again with the dialogue, I somehow knew from the first minute, from the first line of dialogue, I knew it was a female voice. And it had a lyrical quality as like how and then it did turn out to be a female's voice yeah. and i was like well, wow she talks about my lover is a strong and brave and braves the the sea it, it, yeah it's, yeah she's yeah. so infatuated and she's she's it it's, it's another one of those funny moments the first page with the dialogue it, it's written in this beautiful lyrical prose yeah. praising him to the heavens his stormy brow his 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 braveness and his, his manhood, and then you turn the page, and he's this is this manky teenager <laughs> selling fish. <laughs> yeah. yeah. At first, I was like, "Wait, is this? Is she talking about him, or yeah. is this a parallel line of narrative that is, has not been revealed yet?" Yeah, it was really funny. But the, yeah, I mean, but the the mermaid's a very tragic figure. She's a, a, a abused. Yeah. She's an abused. She's been abused by yeah. him. Yeah. By this uh, ugly teen who's kind of sociopathic or yeah. well he's an abuser he doesn't he keeps saying over and over that she's not real oh and yeah her her dialogue too like she it's the dialogue of an abused woman yes. for sure who's yes. in an abusive relationship yes and is convincing herself that it's her fault yes if he's angry it's her fault and can you blame him if he's off with other women yes. i mean he has a hard job and all this stuff and it's really and for his part he doesn't acknowledge that she's a real person yeah over and over he says it in this case, it's literally true because he conjured her out of magic. Oh my God! But, there's a, yeah. Sorry, but even so, like Constantine, in a in a kind moment, Constantine reassures her that she is real because the love that she feels for him is love real, is which magic. proves yeah. that that she's real. And yeah. of course, she has children with him. Yeah. And that's another thing that they talk about with the overfishing, is that this almost that the the fishermen. I think he's having sort of he's a, there's a comment about that that the dangers it's not just the racism but the dangers of overfishing mm. and abusing the environment and he talks about the generation unborn and about he talks about salmon and the sacrifice that salmon make for the generations unborn they mate once and then die for a bounty they'll never see and I think there's a, a sort of gentle environmental message there as well sure. that you need to husband the resources of the present mm. for the generation that you won't see, and of course, the the manky teenager's children, born from the corpse of his <laughs> battered wife, yeah, eat him, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, love it, yeah, yeah, love it, yeah, yeah, it's so good, yeah, um. The next thing, I mean, okay. moving on to something else I really love, yeah. the Prince Andrew issue. Oh my god, yes. I was about to ask, which prince was the pedophile? I couldn't remember which Prince one Andrew. It's Prince Andrew. Prince Andrew, okay. He's a li it's literally him, and he's a literal pedophile. Yeah. <laughs> he's got underage women in his limo. Yeah. Uh, and this is the unicorn one. Yes. Because uh, he's, there's 
feeding on the pride about horse racing and the royal obsession with horse racing and the unicorn on the coat of arms and this all turns into Andy Cap convincing Prince Andrew to uh, take this sperm, yeah, horse he's, sperm. He's which, got a vial of horse sperm that he gives him and he which, tells him it's from a unicorn. It's from a unicorn and uh, so then Constantine is hired to or forced into blackmailed into yeah. the men in black suits come so he's he's kept, he's kidnapped again but this time not by thugs by well they're still thugs but they're a, a, a certain yes they're better paid thugs. standard of yeah. thug yeah they because uh andy cap truthfully told prince andrew that his name was john constantine right so that when things started going wrong when they try to gestate this unicorn yeah they go looking for john constantine and yeah. they find him yeah anyway they drag him there and you were going to say? Well, I, uh, I don't know how much... Uh, we've revealed everything, yeah, so yeah. Part of might as well. So, yeah, the unicorn is born. It turns out, it turns out the horn is actually... Because they're like, what is used as a horn? Uh, it turns out it's actually an egg tooth, so it rips itself out of the horse, and then we get this horrific drawing of a unicorn, a freakish, nightmarish Clive Barker unicorn. Um, Hellraiser. Yeah. Drawn by... Uh, Constantine Hellraiser. Yes, that's yeah. right. Constantine Hellraiser. <laughs> Uh, and it's there's like really dark blue purple lighting on it. It's very, Looks great. It's really grim and. Um, well, it's another it's another tulpa. It's another thought form. This time it's sprung from Prince Andrew's obsession with horses and the idea of uh, of uh, of of a unicorn coming and everyone loving the monarchy again despite its scandals. Yeah. And, but the the unicorn. But it's still a unicorn and it's. A symbol of purity yes. and the idea is that once it emerges into the world and it finds itself not in a, a pure world but it finds itself in mired in utter corruption yeah to be born into a, a stud farm next to prince andrew next to <laughs> prince andrew <laughs> it goes berserk and starts murdering everything yeah, yeah. and um and then in, a, in another clever funny moment how what's how do you calm a unicorn Famously, what's the only way to calm a unicorn? A virgin. Right. And of course, it's an underage virgin that Prince Andrew has in, limo. in the limo. And yeah. she calms the unicorn. Yeah. And then Constantine puts it out of its misery. Yeah. Uh, again, this was... So this is, for me, the Bergara art, and this was really interesting because this was kind of one of the heavier issues you would have expected to go to Aaron Campbell. Um, right. The cartoonishness almost worked in its favor it helped to make prince andrew so goofy looking and you know like <laughs> that um, he doesn't look like prince andrew but he no he doesn't he, he but he he looks like uh, colonel blimp or something yeah he's <laughs> well, yeah he's the queen's but, other son so but, it's, but, yeah, yeah that is who it is. is um but then we get to uh i think the next stage no so the next one's a dream quest yeah there's we, talk about constantine always needs to do what's for the greater good or what he believes is the great good so that's another one of those lines that was on those but then we get to show 11 so we had prince andrew now we actually get there's literally a panel in here i think with nigel farage and boris but boris johnson's right there that's actually oh, yeah. his second appearance in the in the comic at that point that's right but yes that's right <laughs> that is it is his second appearance yeah um, <laughs> his first appearance is when he's buck naked <laughs> Yeah, talking about that takes craziness. an hour to get so... an erection. <laughs> oh yeah! Oh my god! <laughs> he doesn't pull any punches. Uh, no, yeah. Spuria, I, I yeah. Somehow I didn't. It's the first satire. time I was like, oh, it's the it's a prime minister. He says it's the prime minister, but I thought, okay, it's just a fictional prime minister. Oh no, he has the distinctive blonde mop. Yes, definitely but even then I was like, okay, whatever. And then uh, it's another in this one. He's used a photo reference of <laughs> it's Boris Johnson, Johnson. So, okay, standing, so standing next to the bogut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. So um, uh, we kind of get to this. I don't know. Okay, so now we're gonna say we spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. We're an hour, an hour into we've it. We spoiled so much. Let's just we keep have, spoiling. but I think. All right, turn off now if you don't want to hear about the okay. the finale. All right. <laughs> <laughs> the finale. Okay, so it turns out they've got a, the corpse of a giant under. Parliament House. Is it a corpse or is it? Alive? I think it's alive. It's okay. It's alive. It's well. That's worse. It's a giant. This so is the ultimate manifestation of the diseased pride that's sweeping Britain. The great, the greats, the P the MPs, the greats of Parliament, on a daily basis descend into the cellar, where is the. Uh, I think it's another William Blake reference. The giant Albion. Yeah. The progenitor of the Isles, is lying there, and they 
cut holes in it. They grab and, a knife and fuck it. They cut a hole. They cut the wound alike in Crash. Um, so, oh boy. So, <laughs> and that's how the issue ends with Constantine discovering, seeing the corpse, and seeing this pile of bodies. All these, they, all these people that are all they put on. They all put on masks, a la eyes wide shut. Yeah, and they, <laughs> <laughs> and they, and they, and they're fucking the giant. They're, and and it's it's literally Britain. So they're literally fucking Britain. <laughs> they're they're fucking Britain. Britain. Yeah. Uh, wow. It's that's almost. It's more literal than the taxi sign jabbing into <laughs> yes. Constantine's side in issue zero. Um. Totally amazing. Uh, yeah. Then we get to twelve, where um, the triple spoiler. And this is what th this seems to be the. Th this seems like the big the, the plan. This is what's been hinted at. Right now, we should point out that around issue eight is when DC tells uh, Spurrier that the series is canceled. Uh. So we've got now we've got a double sized issue twelve. So he's got to kind of wrap it up. So and he yes yeah he may have been planning. Like twelve more issues or something. He, he he said in that in that blog post that you mentioned earlier, where he he rants and raves right. about the, the sad fact that it's cancelled. He mentioned that he was hoping to go to at least eighteen or twenty. Right. So we've kind of how quickly it, the first the second six was approved. Yeah. He was anticipating at least six more issues, and that's this finale is rushed. It is a yeah. I I think I I, I, didn't, I agree. I didn't it was enjoy very. It. It's rushed. Too many reveals. I didn't shall mind. I the... Shall I go through them? Okay. Well, I, I don't. I, okay. First, before you reveal all the reveals, I'm going to say I didn't. The 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 one about Noah, I did not. I didn't foresee that. Oh, I, okay. And I was like, oh, that's really. I don't good. like to brag, but I. Um. So we have to say that before the whole point of Andy Cap wanted Constantine to be guilt free and to kill himself. Yes. And Constantine, much like with the Garthenis lung cancer run, finds a trick to get his soul, not his soul, into the handicap, but to get a different soul. He gets a vestibulin soul to go into the handicap, and then Andy, the vestibulin, or sorry, handicap rejects it. Um, but also he does something which causes himself to be super burdened with guilt. And that is he um, gets Noah to kill Tommy, Tommy. Willow Tree. <sighs> Now this, I think this is a massive cop out. I think. Okay, tell uh, me why. Noah should have been killed. Okay. So. Oh, we haven't. So we haven't. Give this. Give us a reveal. About okay. Noah. All right. So first of all, all right. We got. <laughs> first of all, okay. So we need to go back a little bit. Yeah. Andy Cap wants Constantine's soul. Yes. That's established quite early on. Yeah. He doesn't have one, or for whatever reason we don't know, but he wants his soul, and he wants it as guilt-free as possible. Yeah. <laughs> But so what's but but then what's this other plan then? What's with all of the manifestations of pride and so on? Anyway, we don't we're not sure. Anyway, then we got re our reveals in the finale. Okay. The first re reveal: Tommy Willow Trees goes to rescue the giant and messes it up because it turns out the giant is not the giant Albion at all. It's yet another thought form. Right. It's a tulpa. Okay. Presumably created by the parliamentarians. So that's so that's the reveal. It's a not even the giant. So whatever that whole sinister thing was, it, it's not a thing. It's just another one of those pride manifestations. Mm -hmm. The second reveal: the purpose of the tulpas and the and the generating of the toxic pride is that every time Constantine banishes one, so Constantine's been running around fixing what he thinks of as great wrongs, but it's all part of Andy Cap's plan. Every time he banishes a tulpa. The Tulpa's pride energy flows back to Andy Like Cap Highlander. <laughs> like Highlander. So, uh, so he's been doing Andy Cap Constantine's evil bidding by running around banishing these... So Andy Cap's been telling Constantine he needs to unburden himself of guilt, and Constantine's been ignoring him and running around fixing things, but he was doing Andy Cap's bidding all along. They're pride batteries. Andy Cap needs the pride for something. Mm. Then, it turns out that he's using it as kind of uh, a counterweight to Constantine's guilty soul. Constantine's soul is so toxic and so burdened mm -hmm. with guilt and self-loathing that Andy Cap Constantine needs to marshal the pride of an entire nation just to defend himself from the corrosive effects of all that self-loathing and guilt. Okay. 
then it's revealed that <laughs> Andy Cap Constantine himself is a tulpa. Right. He's not a real person. So he's not actually a future Constantine or an alternate universe Constantine. He himself is a tulpa, which yeah. is why he's so good with tulpas. He was generated by Constantine at the moment of death. Yeah. When he was surrounded by all of the wild magic in the in issue zero. Yeah. In that grand battle, there was so much magic flying around. He couldn't help but use a bit of it at the moment of death to create a way out. But the tulpa, the handicap Constantine tulpa, has his own agenda, mm -hmm. which is that he wants to become real. Okay. And so, and he needs Constantine's soul for that. So that's the next reveal. So we've got three so far. But the giant is a tulpa. The tulpas are all pride batteries, and Evil Constantine's sucking it all up. Yeah. Evil Constantine is a tulpa himself. And then the final reveal. Yeah. Noah is Constantine's son. Yeah. So, but, and yeah, it's too many reveals. It is a lot for 40 pages. Or he just didn't look, and I can't blame the guy. He obviously had a plan for how he wanted this to come out and he had to wrap it all up in yes. essentially one issue yeah and it's just too much and it took it takes me out of the it took me out of the story yeah i think so i did like the aspect of making noah oh so this is the point you said you didn't like but okay. making noah kill tommy and you said i think it's killed, a cop out been, yeah. i think it's a cop out so tommy so tommy what's happened is the uh the vestibulum the demon from Constantine's cell phone has been busted by the demons of hell. Yeah. Constantine does a con, as usual, except it doesn't work. The con is that he tricks the vestibulum into occupying his body at the moment of death. Yeah. So then, instead of Andicap Constantine receiving Constantine's soul, he receives the demon, the vestibulum, instead. But then, it turns out, because Andicap Constantine is a tulpa, the vestibulum can't interact with him. Right. Then, Handicap Constantine. I can't believe this is what we came up with. <laughs> Handicap Constantine grabs the vestibulum, draws a mystic sigil on his brow, and sends him back. And that sigil marks him out to the demons of hell, whom the vestibulum has been hiding from in Constantine's smartphone. Yes. Now they're coming. And how they come is by possessing people in the immediate vicinity. First, they possess the Haruspex. Yep. Uh, then... They murder him, but then it possesses Tommy Willow Trees. And this demon is apparently bad news. Constantine says, there's absolutely no way we can let this demon come into the real world. It'll make everything we've dealt with so far look like a picnic. We've got to fix this. And so Noah takes a knife and cuts Tommy Willow Trees' throat. And that apparently is the final, is the straw that broke the camel's back for Constantine. It's, it pushes his guilt and his self-loathing over the limit of the of the pride armor that Handicap Constantine has gathered for himself, and it ends up killing him, killing Handicap Constantine. Right. That is so. That's kind of like the situation, and I think that's a cop out. Okay. I I think it's just not. I don't buy it. I don't buy that Constantine would be that horrified that he made his son commit murder. That well, it would his, be his thing was that he made his son like him. His words are. His words are, I made him me, or I made him like me, or something like that, similar to me. I get it. I get it. And, sure, but I think that, I, I still, I don't, I think it was a, I think what should have happened is Noah. He should have sacrificed, he literally sacrificed I'm, his firstborn son is what I think should have happened. I, okay, I'm going to say one thing about killing Noah, if, okay. if he was to kill Noah. And I'm going to go on a wild tangent to get okay. to this point. I used to watch The Walking Dead. Up to about, <laughs> about up to about season six or seven, and um, what happened was it was very difficult to get my wife to watch more of it. So it would start in September, and it would be about December before she could work up the armor to watch more Walking Dead. So it would, <laughs> it, would, it would tend to get it would tend to get spoiled. I would tend to get spoilers for it before it came out, and I'd like, oh, okay, so this is what happens, and that shows currency is plot. Um, but it, it turned out that the end of at the end of season six or something, one of the characters was definitely going to die, and we didn't know which one it was. And then I heard a spoiler that in season seven it turned out to be uh, this character called Glenn, uh, played can't remember his name. He's a Korean American actor. Anyway, 
Um, he's a good actor. Uh, okay, my thing was, he was the only Asian character on the show. Now, okay. my thing was, okay, that, then I stopped. I said, okay, Glenn's dead. I said, like, this is a, this is a work of fiction. It's not real life. I get you, you're trying to be hard and gritty, and you're killing off the character that's been there since season one. You're trying to be Game of Thrones. That's fine. But to kill off your only Asian American character, are you kidding me? This is fiction. You don't have to do that. Yeah. So if they killed the only, if they killed Noah, who was one of the of the gang so there's there's he's, constantine there's black, nat there's mention. noah yeah. constantine nat noah and willow tree i think it's is it the four of them basically are the team effectively four, three of them are, are white and noah's the only and noah's the only color. black guy and okay. if he killed that off that guy it's i would be like well come on it's, it's fiction you could go another way and i guess it was willow tree now as we were discussing before the problem with willow tree is we haven't maybe Maybe he, he, he was not well-defined from day one because he was a sacrificial He's just like a lamb. victim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's sort of like a victim from start to finish. Everyone plays him. He's faintly ridiculous. Wait, he's kind of almost crucified in one For no scene. real reason. It's really kind of gruesome. Andy Cap shows up and, and just bangs rail spikes into his yeah. wrists. Yeah. Why? Just to... Uh... I don't know. I, it's just he's just this victim. I, I just think it's. I, I didn't like that. And then what? And then his his whole purpose is to get sacrificed at the end so that Constantine will feel bad that his son, who <laughs> incidentally belonged to a. Okay, you convinced a, me. Yeah. But you're you're right as well. And yeah, look, and it's consistent too because con, consistent thematically because a lot of it is that Constantine uses up people around him by forcing them to yeah. do. To be bad or to suffer. Yeah, it's what happened to Chaz in issue okay. zero. And yeah. so Although my Chaz thing is, you can't literally kill him. dies. Yes. <laughs> so maybe that would have been good bookends. Chaz dies in zero. Noah dies in. But yeah. yeah but on the other hand, it's Tommy. Tommy Willowtree still dies. Yeah. yeah and I, it, just, I mean, if it was Nat, I mean, you've got I your only like female, the new, only yeah. female on the team. Uh, so I think you're kind of stuck with the guy. And so I think he tried to make him likable by having other characters say they really liked him, yeah, but even just though he's a joke. Showing not, you know, like telling, not showing those. Just like telling yes. it, Tommy. Everyone really likes Tommy. He's really yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, no, no, no. He's like a fucking caricature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Poor guy. Yeah. Um, but okay, so at the end of the end of the road here, what we got is uh, either way, DC canceling a really amazing series. It's such a tragedy. Not necessarily. I mean, we we're coronavirus year we had a very it looked at the march april march in that area it looked like it was the end of the comics industry i mean when they shut the stores and diamond stopped shipping i was like mm. this is it comics are done uh somehow kind of came back but i think it was enough of a dent it is, does amaze me that they didn't even try to put out trade paperbacks and see how they sold uh, before canceling the series but here we are it's another there used to be a website called what what was it? What stupid thing has DC done to <laughs> And, um... Cancelling this. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it's, it's, re it's really disappointing because it's really, really good. Everybody buy it. Yeah. It's a bit late now, but... It is. Although it's just come yeah. out, I think, in, in the first six issues, okay. plus issue zero, plus the Timothy Hunter issue have been, come out as a, I guess, a trade okay, paperback. Cool. I read on the, on the blog. So, huh. I guess... If you, I I'm guess gonna it go, could I'm be gonna resurrected go somehow, but he's left it open. Yeah, uh, and there's there's a hook even. Oh yeah, there is seems to be dead. dead. Yeah, he's not breathing. Mm. He's alive, but he's not breathing. So so there's a hook. Yeah. So I guess if we all Deadpool it and create a lot of internet buzz for issues thirteen to sixteen or thirteen to eighteen of of Constantine Hellraiser. <laughs> it could it could come back. Yeah. Um, when I say Deadpool, it I'm referring to Ryan Reynolds leaking the trailer for the Deadpool movie on the internet and creating enough buzz for it to get funded. Right. Yeah. It's. I think there was also another. I feel like there was. A, I heard there was another black label Constantine series before this one, maybe that was not good. Okay. Uh, but I that must have been ignored based on the story structure of this one, where he wakes up from the DC dream. Very clever. Um, he must have ignored that other Black Label series as well. He had a lot of dreams. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, 
Um, okay, any final thoughts? Any, anything else? I think I've summed it up. I think it's great. Yeah, I think the, the quality of writing is really... I was amazed, totally amazed. And I've read, like, maybe one other... Maybe two Cy Spurrier comics before, and they were not functioning on this level. I think he was a real... I think he's a real Constantine fanboy who's he, like, oh my god, I get to work on Constantine. And he really... And you hear people say that, and they do this thing, and it's crud. Um, but he's done it, and really... The, again, like I can't do the voices, so read them, please, because it's amazing how everyone has a distinct voice within speaking five words, yep. and it's all in the art and the coloring and the lettering, as I said before, is all really, they're, all the wheels are greased, and this thing is really running very perfectly until issue 12 when DC was like... You got to wrap. You got ten you extra wrap pages. You wrap up ten all, extra pages yeah, all those plot threads. Wrap and them all I, up, even baby. When you said that the that uh, that other guy, the head of the gang, was the gang leader was possessed. I was like, oh, that happened. I was like, I really it was hard to follow some of the action in that issue because it is there's a lot crammed. It's, it's too much, in there. and that's no, that's not his fault. That's DC's fault. Yeah. <sighs> oh, yeah. that. That Stacey's fault is going to be the last word of the episode. I'm going to stop it there. <laughs> Fantastic. Nice work. John Constantine Hellblazer is published by DC. Want to support this podcast? You can help us out by joining us on Patreon at patreon.com slash deconcomics. And go to deconstructingcomics.com to connect to us on Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube, to shop on Amazon to support the show, and to find links to subscribe to the podcast. Our theme is by J.B. Anderton. Don't forget our Full Metal Alchemist podcast, The Law of Equivalent Exchange, is now in its own feed and available in the usual podcast outlets. Our review of Chapter 6 is coming out January 18th. If you're looking for some constructive feedback on your comic, send it to us and we'll critique it on our spinoff podcast, Critiquing Comics. Send it to mail at deconstructingcomics.com. We'll read at least 30 pages of it and critique it on the show. Another episode this Saturday about a Go Comics strip called Bear With Me by Bob Scott. Then next week on Deconstructing Comics, I talk about comics about COVID-19 and the field of graphic medicine with Alice Jaggers. She's an expert in the field of graphic medicine, which refers to comics that touch on health issues. Those could be instructional comics, but also it includes some graphic novels and series that you've probably read. I'll also be talking with nonfiction cartoonist Josh Newfeld about a recent comic he did on journalistsresource.org called A Tale of Two Pandemics, which explores the issue of race in the 1918 and 2020 pandemics and the persistent myth that blacks were somehow more resistant to disease. Finally, I've set up a GoFundMe campaign to help me move, to get away from an apartment I've developed an allergy to. Getting a new place in Tokyo is quite expensive, so I'd appreciate your help. The link is in the show notes. Till next time, this is Tim, and thanks for listening to Deconstructing Comics. 